Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar, Saving Our Suburbs Part 1, How to Create Successful Suburbs. I'm Jen Halls, Partnership Manager for Island Press. This is our first in a three-part webinar series in association with the book, Suburban Remix. Part two and three will take place in January and March of 2019. January 29th is the date for part two of this webinar series. Please look out for more information on uh, the future webinars for the series uh, in the future. <laughs> Our webinar today is hosted by Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to its complex problems. Island Press elevates voices of change, shines a spotlight on crucial issues, and focuses attention on sustainable solutions, like we're doing today with this free webinar presentation. I'd like to thank our amazing uh, webinar sponsors uh, for helping to make this event possible. They are Stantec, the Congress of New Urbanism, or CNU, Build a Better Burb, America Walks, and the American Planning Association's National Capital Area Chapter. Please consider supporting and or joining these organizations that are helping to create this free educational resource and a more livable environment for all of us. Today, you'll be if you are listening live, you are eligible to receive 1.5 AICP CM credits from, from the American Planning Association for the webinar. These credits are not available if you are listening to the recording. Expect to receive a copy of the recording in the next day or two. Uh, please feel free to share this, again, because it's an educational resource. Our webinar panelists today include David Dixon, Chris Leinberger, and Jason Besky. They are presenting. They will not be presenting in that order. It will be David, uh, Jason, and then Chris. Our conversation today will be moderated by Lisa Seamus, Communications Manager for the Congress of New Urbanism. Lisa joined CNU last year and is the editor of their blog on suburban design, Building a Better, Build a Better Burp. She grew up in the suburbs of Dallas and walked away for decades before re relocating to the suburban community of Wheaton, Maryland three years ago. As a longtime writer and editor in the field of communication, community planning, and placemaking, she's now working to reconcile her dedication to urbanism with the needs and realities of suburban America. Uh, so uh, this is David Dixon. I'm simply going to jump in. Uh, and the first slide I'll ask you to look at is shows a happy young man uh, riding his uh, tractor mower. Uh, doing something that people used to love, which is mowing his lawn. Uh, and uh, the quote on the side comes from basically uh, a member of the community in Roanoke County, outside of the city of Roanoke, where uh, we were doing a plan to... Excuse me? Uh, uh, do, do we have a plan to... So next slide shows somebody... Uh, not so much enjoying mowing his lawn, doing a plan to uh, transform a failing mall, the Tanglewood Mall, uh, into a walkable urban center, uh, speaking Chris Leinberger's language. And somebody raised his hand and said, so I get it. North America is a suburban continent with an urban population. And I thought this fellow really captured what was going on. So if you step back in history, suburbs had a romantic uh, birth. Uh, this was a, uh, a vision of, of uh, escaping to New Rochelle. Uh, then came the post-World War II uh, baby boom, rapid growth of the middle class. The one place we could house everyone was in suburbs, Levittown. Maybe we overdid it. Uh, oh, and then, I'm sorry. And now I have advanced, I'm sorry, I've advanced uh, from the fellow mowing his lawn to a beautiful view a uh, house that we can all aspire to in New Rochelle, past an image of Levittown, past an image of maybe sprawl out of control, and right up to the Villages, Florida, a big sign that says foreclosure, the Great Recession. Uh, and when the Great Recession hit in 2008, and next slide, uh, it basically cleared our, our, our eyes and revealed the dramatic changes going on in our world. So rather than this be the suburban aspiration, this is New Rochelle uh, in the uh, around 2010 announcing its new uh, vibrant mixed use walkable downtown. This is how it now saw its future. Uh, and this 
what the uh, recession did, I'm now on the next slide, the new normal 101, uh, is make clear uh, that uh, how much had changed. Uh, and uh, the new normal 101 is about demographics, it's about knowledge economy, it's about disruptive changes that are continuing uh, to change the world around us, and the ways in which all of these reshape Okay, reshape our, our urban world. So, uh, let's and it looks like, uh, let me, Dave, let me interrupt you for a second. It looks like we have your screen back on, so you are Thank uh, you. presenting your Thank slides. You. Thank you. Um, and so let's start with demographics. Um, the, if, uh, this, the, you'll notice a, uh, couple of, of rings near the top says the U.S. is growing older and younger. Uh, the first says 1990 to 2010. It really could say 1950 or maybe 1948 to 2010. Most of our population growth was folks, turned out to be folks 35, the, the fastest growing, let's say, segment of our population were folks 35 to 65, the same folks who buy houses, have kids, buy cars, and pretty much shaped our world. 2010 to 2030, and you could really say 2040, you will notice that that what was a small green portion of the first uh, circle is now the majority of our growth. The majority of our growth for the next into the 2040s will be folks over 65, next largest segment folks under 35. Uh, what this has translated into uh, is a population in which, well, 62% of our housing stock is single family and suburban, 22% of our population uh, consists of households with two adults and kids. This is the natural market. If you segment our market and say which group prefers single family houses in the suburbs, this is the one group that on net balance prefers that housing. Uh, clearly, our housing supply is out of balance to um, sort of uh, um, put Further emphasis on what's happening, uh, go down to higher income households or moving to cities. Basically, uh, if you look at income by decile, the more affluent we are, and it turns out the more educated we are, the more we're trying to move into cities. And finally, if you look at the last couple of charts, you will notice that by 2025, two households with kids will equal 10% of our population. The other 90% is more naturally urban in their housing preferences. Um, take a look, quick look at suburbs and uh, or at, at how where our population is aging fastest. And it turns out to be suburbs where folks over 65 are basically growing twice as fast as folks younger than, than 65 and frankly, much faster than, than the number of kids. Um, if you're as old as I am, and I don't know if any of you are, um, uh, this is what the world looked like when you turned on television as a kid. And the one thing you'll notice is there are lots of bright eyed, I have to say white kids and each of these happy families uh, turn on a television today or look at a film or look at your, your at Netflix. And this is what we tell ourselves we look like. Uh, and one of the uh, really profound messages here is not only do we have all sorts of different households, uh, but 80% of net new households for the next 20 years are going to be singles and couples. And remember, it is net new households that buy houses uh, and basically shape our regions. So no surprise what is happening. Uh, 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 urban housing prices uh, are rising much faster than suburban, uh, particularly since 2000, starting before the Great Recession. Uh, the map to your to the right is my dear region of Boston, and the brighter the red, the faster values have risen coming out of uh, well since 2005, but it really came out of the recession. The darker the blue, the more they have not yet come back to uh, pre-recession levels, and you can see the message immediately. The closer you are to the core the faster prices are rising. This message is repeated in region after region. So we have a profound urban opportunity. Uh, housing is basically two thirds of our real estate market in this country. So two thirds of our real estate market is moving, is trying to move into urban areas in cities or suburbs. So, but now comes an imperative. So with this opportunity, comes a real need to urbanize. Uh, and it starts with the fact that most of us have not had enough kids uh, or, or the number of kids that our economy would like to have for of us to have had, meaning that uh, if you look at the first chart on this slide, U.S. adding fewer new workers, um, 
if you go all the way over to 2040, uh, the U.S. will add fewer net new workers in 2040 than we did in 2010. So go over to the right, next uh, next chart. Uh, what this means, because uh, coming out of the recession, 90% of all net new jobs require a college education. Uh, 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 many fewer net new workers, jobs all clustering in one area. We are developing a distinct shortage of knowledge workers. Go down to college educated 26 to 49 year olds are moving to cities. Um, there's been a lot of talk, uh, folks have said, gee, the same number of millennials are living in suburbs and cities today, today as, is... uh, as did, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. There's a very distinct difference. If you have a college education, you're uh, on net balance moving into an urban core. Uh, if you have less than four years of education, you're moving out. So frankly, if you, from an educa education standpoint, the, the population mix is uh, tilting uh, education towards cities. Uh, what is happening uh, is that uh, uh, employers, particularly knowledge economy employers, and it is our knowledge economy that is where our economic growth is occurring. It is knowledge economy jobs and knowledge economy investment that every city, every region and every city is pursuing, at least every city I've worked in in the U.S., uh, uh, what's happened to rents in cities as a result? They've risen eight times faster in cities than in suburbs, office rents. Uh, here, the discrepancy or the difference is, is greater than for housing uh, because our knowledge economy, which is where all growth coming, is trying as hard as it can to get into urban areas where it can find the labor supply uh, it needs. So opportunity, Tremendous demand for housing in walkable urban amenity rich areas. Uh, imperative, uh, every city, but also increasingly every suburb that wants a commercial tax base needs to create these walkable, lively, amenitized places to attract the workforce, educated folks who, uh, for whom, who jobs and, uh, and investment uh, follow. So, but now there's something that the, the, these facts have been around for a while. I think it's important to really put them into context, uh, particularly when we're talking to folks in our communities, understand the changes in their lives. But there are other rapidly disruptive changes that are happening that actually reinforce uh, the urban opportunity uh, and, and imperative. And it starts with what's happening to uh, our economic um, uh, disparities. Um, uh, basically, the uh, folks in the, if you look at the chart at the top, income disparities are growing. Uh, basically, the higher your income, the more it is growing. I think everyone knows this. We are becoming richer and poorer. Economic um, uh, disparities are, are baked in. Uh, no longer uh, for 80% of us do our incomes track growing pr um, uh, productivity in this country. That stopped in about 1980. Uh, and it turns out that basically upward mobility, if you are born poor, you're probably going to stay poor. Uh, if you uh, then go down to the chart on the lower right, uh, poverty in U.S. suburbs, uh, it, poverty is moving to suburbs. It increased by more than 50 percent uh, in our, more than half of our, of our top metros uh, in the last decade. Uh, what is particularly interesting to note, uh, those cities that have been really successful in creating lively or, or, or attracting high wage jobs, knowledge industry jobs, look at the larger red circles on this map, are the same regions uh, that are busy, that are frankly exporting poverty to our, uh, to our suburbs. So what in effect is happening as cities compete for knowledge economy? become more amenitized, more walkable, more cool, more fun, and more attractive to folks with a lot of education and therefore, frankly, larger incomes, uh, and urban housing prices and rents are going up, uh, there's been a lot of displacement. This is creating a different kind of imperative for suburbs because they need to create valuable places that basically provide the resources to deal with the issues of growing poverty in, in suburbs. They need to create high value places. 
Uh, and if you look at what's happening to suburban offices and suburban traditional suburban offices and suburban housing, its value is declining relative to what's going on in cities. Suburbs now need to create the kinds of high value places where incomes are growing rapidly uh, in order to find, to create the fiscal resources to deal with a much more economically diverse population. Think of, if nothing else, the challenges in schools and social services. Um, so uh, if older folks over 65 are one of the fastest growing demographics in suburbs, the other, frankly, is folks who live under the poverty line. Their number increased by more than 50 percent between 2000 and 2016. Um, so uh, let's come now to we've all heard a lot about the disruption of, of retail. Uh, I won't. I think this story is well known. Uh, roughly half of all retail leases last year were for restaurants or food or caffeine or something that, that basically places that serve something you can eat or drink. Um, what is happening, began happening really about 2012, is the drop in sales uh, as due to internet competition really began to decrease, uh, to, to, to cut into the amount of retail floor space that could be supported. And these are for large mass retailers, think the anchors in suburban malls and suburban strip centers, which is one reason why these are beginning to fail at an accelerating rate. But it's not just the internet. As our economy has, because our incomes have, uh, uh, the disparities have grown, mass retailers, frankly, um, uh, uh, focus their business model around folks with median and lower incomes. Um, this, this, their, the share of income that they compete for is basically uh, stagnant or dropping compared to the share of income that expensive restaurants and cool boutique retailers can compete for. Their share is growing. So it's not just the internet, it's also our growing economic disparities that are hurting mass market retail um, malls and strip centers. Um, and then the third, and this is more of a disruption, this is a revolution that's coming. And it's coming, I think, a lot faster than most of us realize and with much more urban implications than I think most of us realize uh, is the advent of autonomous mobility, uh, which, um, uh, 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 Morgan Stanley predicts will uh, by even by uh, the beginning of the next of, of the uh, of, by the, at the end of the 2020s will already compete for something close to more than 20 percent of, of all trips. Um, what this means uh, actually uh, is that um, because it's not so much getting in your uh, uh, Tesla and having it drive you around that will be our future. The real future is, particularly if we plan this right, is going to be shared, shared autonomous, autonomous mobility. mobility. So uh, uh, the uh, Mar Mary Barra, the new president of General Motors, according to Forbes, was brought in to uh, manage uh, 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 General Motors as it is racing to adjust to a rapidly approaching future of shared electric autonomous vehicles. Well, what does this future spell for cities and suburbs? Um, it starts with the fact uh, that this is happening fast. Um, shared autonomous vehicles will go into mass production in the early 2020s. By the late 2020s, 60% of our vehicles, shared or not, will have connected technology. This will be a real turning point uh, in how we develop because when your car has shared connected technology in it and you pull up to a parking garage, for example, you will not park your car yourself. If you'll excuse me, you will say to your car, go park yourself and your car will park itself much more compactly and efficiently than you can. So the amount of space we need to park a thousand cars will drop from let's say 350,000 square feet to about 200,000, maybe 225,000 square feet, meaning we're gonna have start having by the end of the next decade, lots of empty spaces in our parking garages. And by the probably mid 2000, late 2030s, uh, uh, driverless vehicles will be the norm, uh, a $7 trillion industry by 2050. So there are all kinds of implications, but one really critical implication, think of a, of a, of a 20 year period in which there is an immense urban opportunity uh, as our population basically 
Uh, Eighty percent of of households or singles and couples is much more urban in its housing preferences. Uh, think of a an economy that is seeking to follow educated workers into cities. Think of the demand in our urban cores, uh, and now look at the implication uh, simply the, of shared autonomous mobility, uh, which means click of a button, you can go anywhere you want in an urban core where there's a, a critical mass of of people and trips uh, and uh, at less than half the cost of, let's say, an Uber pool uh, today. Uh, uh, if in 2010, let's say we'd used Oklahoma City as a test case, a million square feet, square feet of mixed use development needed more than a million square feet of parking, go to 2000, let's say 20, the 2020s, uh, 60% of vehicles are connected. Look at all that, that light gray is all the parking uh, the the space that's no longer needed to park uh, cars for that first million square feet, the blue is all the additional square feet that downtown Oklahoma City could support without spending a penny to develop a new structured or any any parking. Move to the mid late 2030s, and basically uh, the amount of square footage in a typical American city, but also an urbanized center in a suburb will basically be three times what it is today without spending a penny on uh, parking. So this opportunity is one that is, uh, Chris will talk a lot more about, about how, how prevalent and widespread it is. Uh, this is good old Tanglewood Mall in Roanoke, Virginia. This is the town center. It's on its way to, to being with, with broad community support. And I love this. Walmart uh, wants to turn some of its stores into town centers. Uh, including two in North Texas. And having been on a ULI jury for North Texas recently, it is amazing how rapidly the Dallas region is urbanizing. Uh, it, suburban Dallas is, is urbanizing. But I want to finish with um, three or four, excuse me, sort of real thresholds for success. Because uh, if the opportunity and the imperative are there, if the rapid changes in our society are actually accentuating both the opportunity and the imperative, uh, what does it take most fundamentally, and this is simply from our experience in working with lots of suburbs to, to plan for this transition, to adapt, and it starts with leadership. Um, this is Mayor Eva Galambos, uh, mayor of the most politically conservative community I have ever worked in and proud of it, Sandy Springs, Georgia. Sandy, with Eva's uh, leadership, Sandy Springs is now creating City Springs, a new heart for uh, uh, this suburb. This is a suburb that frankly privatized city government. I say this so that people don't feel that uh, it is only liberal places that can make these kinds of changes. Uh, but what Eva did was convene a community conversation and lead it, uh, one full of, of, of education. Uh, and she basically said that um, uh, this was an affluent community, very much like Dublin, Ohio, uh, another place that's moved far along. She said, uh, some of you may recognize this fellow, um, it doesn't matter how successful we are today. What me worry? Yes, because of the uh, rapid changes in um, our demographics and our economy and the other changes coming. Um, Dublin, Ohio has created now uh, a walkable, mixed-use, lively downtown Bridge Park about 3 million square feet uh, in the heart of what has long been considered the iconic suburb of, of Ohio and in many, for many of the, of the Midwest. Um, it takes partnership. Um, uh, structured parking is more expensive than surface parking, and these new urban centers in suburbs are competing with older suburban development that has inexpensive surface parking. They need structured parking. They need streets and great streetscape and public parks and the infrastructure of urbanity. Um, uh, Dublin invested about, this is Bridge Park, about $300 million in Bridge Park, uh, which is just fine because developers of Bridge Park have invested several billion dollars in Bridge, in Bridge, in Bridge Park. I don't know of a suburban community that has not felt its investment and in these kinds of partnerships did not pay back very rich dividends. Uh, and finally, it's about transformative planning. It's allowing markets to take the lead, but putting markets to work to create the kind of place that re represents the real heart and soul of a changing suburban community. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, David.
this is Jason, and we're going to do a quick transition. Uh, we put a, a, a message down in the chat. Uh, we lost some internet access from the organizer, so we're going to just get things arranged real quick, and then I'll continue on. Jen, are you with us? Hi, this is Lisa. You can hear me. I am transitioning now. Oh, you're in. Okay, great. I am just... Let me know if you got it, Jason. All right, I've got it. And let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. 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 Excellent. All right. Um, so my name is Jason Besky, and uh, David and I co-authored Suburban Remix. And one of the things we talk about uh, beyond the thresholds David had mentioned is is placemaking. And uh, Given the demographics and what's happening and the trends in the country for suburbs, talking suburbs really start to look at uh, social and physical placemaking in their uh, future endeavors. So what I'll talk about today is uh, placemaking from uh, both those perspectives. From a social perspective, uh, placemaking is guided by the belief that the social aspects of the community and personal well-being are of utmost importance. From a physical perspective, it is a tool for marketing an idea or the act of designing and creating a place where people want to live. Uh, but I like to look at this from kind of a combined perspective, and that is the act of creating places both from a physical and, and, and social perspective and bringing together a diversity of interests, which is key, uh, to impart places of lasting value. Uh, or in the dictum of Gertrude Stein, uh, placemaking is about putting the there there. So just a quick story of my growing up, and this is a uh, this is West Acres Mall in Fargo, North Dakota, my hometown, and uh, opened in 1972. One of my earliest memories is being uh, wheeled into this mall in a stroller, and and just the awe as you know a young kid I was in as we entered kind of the this new era of retail. But what happened is you can see um, on the bottom of the, towards the middle of the screen here is West Acres. Uh, this is an aerial image of Fargo from 1970. You would have thought they had better graphics we're kind of fortunate as uh, planners and urban designers today to be able to have some of those but anyway towards the top of the screen is downtown and you can see that um, there is this effect that is stretching the community out and pulling that retail and, and uh, sprawling out towards the outside of Fargo and this is the downtown that uh, suffered at the um, growth of that mall and the separation retail you can see uh, downtown Fargo here has uh, many gray parking spots and really no no play, one place to call uh, the heart of the community or, or that central gathering uh, place for the community. Uh, so what ended up, as I was growing up and, and putting uh, countless numbers of quarters in the arcade machine in the mall, the central gathering place, as you can see on the left side here, was the uh, the fountain at West Acres Mall. And it was in a private, it was a privatized uh, public space, but you can see the opening of the mall at the top right. and uh, for some reason, this mall has persevered over the years, uh, even to the point where they're reinventing the retail at the mall and, and starting to go more outward. And you can see the, the revised entrance on the uh, bottom right. So all that is to say, as our communities grow, as the suburbs uh, grow, what is it that we can do as planners and urban designers and policymakers to really be aware of placemaking and the role that it plays in creating and reading uh, communities uh, that, where people want to live? And gap. So I'm going to go over uh, three dimensions of urban design, uh, the, the realms of urban design, the first being uh, streets and circulation, those are the roads, the sidewalks, trails, uh, transit, uh, second being open space, uh, including private, uh, which I mentioned, which should be accessible in most, if not all cases, and finally our buildings and uh, land use. That's uh, the placement or intensity of the buildings, design to a degree, and the mixture of uses within those buildings. Uh, let me just start real quick to further emphasize the that, that urban design framework or the, the realms of urban design. And this is just a quick slide of a project I worked on when I was in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, and subsequently, um, it just was announced today that Crystal City, uh, part of Arlington, this area here, as you can see, uh, this is just awarded to Amazon's head, uh, HQ2 uh, as part of their headquarters, second headquarters. But uh, Chris will be talking a little bit more about that in his final presentation. Anyway, the, the uh, site that I wanted to, to show here was this, this Penplay site. 
just here's the Pentagon for reference if anybody wants to know. But anyway, this site uh, on the right side of the screen really gives a good uh, way to show how we uh, introduce that urban design framework into the uh, process. Uh, design guidelines were created, and I need to figure out this. Uh, the design guidelines were, lines were created really to talk about those um, those realms, and that we set, set up the streets and uh, open space network, and um, the Penn Place site being on the top here. But we set uh, uh, the blocks and street network um, in that in that site. We also looked at the open space network. The open space network was key to what we wanted to accomplish in this area in that we wanted to make it a walkable and pedestrian friendly area, a place where people could gather. So that was uh, really important to create public spaces for people. And then ultimately on the far right in this diagram shows how the buildings then fit into that diagram. All right, so within those uh, the realms of urban design, I want to go over uh, some examples of placemaking characteristics. You can see those here. I would say key to this is really having a walkable and connected uh, environment, as well as a multi-layer public realm. So first, let's talk about uh, streets and, and circulation. The, I would say the focus of my presentation is, is on this because since more than any other of the uh, realms, uh, this has the opportunity to really um, set up future walkable urban places uh, along with appropriate regulations for uh, creating places in the suburbs. And I'll just mention too that millennials are more prone to live in the suburbs that have, have a diversity of mobility choices. So as you try to attract uh, varied uh, Demographics uh, keep in mind that millennials would prefer a mobility mobility choices, be it in transit or trails, bike lanes, what have you. So two of the key uh, areas within uh, streets and circulation are walkability and connectivity. Walkability obviously being the ability to walk or desire, ease and comfort uh, to be able to walk. And uh, connectivity being both internal connectivity within a development as well as the ability for that development to connect externally to new development uh, to the region and to other modes of transportation. <laughs> Here are a couple examples on the left, Bethesda Row in uh, Maryland, in Bethesda, Maryland, and you can see at the center that the street network is, is it provides a good set of bones for future development, which uh, has been very successful in Bethesda. And this is a previously an industrial area that was uh, basically retrofitted to have a mixed-use walkable environment. And then Reston Town Center on the right side, uh, and I'll go over this a little bit more in Reston, but you can see the grid of streets uh, and, the, uh, and the figure ground there. But if you look at the exterior of that, the grid kind of starts to fall apart a little bit. So here's an aerial of Reston, Virginia, and this is the town center. And I think Chris will talk about this a little bit later, but what Reston did right, uh, being kind of one of the earliest examples of walkable urbanism in a greenfield development, it was put together those three realms of uh, development, of the urban design realms together, and looking at it from the streets and circulation standpoint, uh, there are three primary things that really uh, help Reston Town Center, that being a grid of streets, those laid out, the dash lines represent just those uh, paths that are accessible to pedestrians. There's also a transit hub uh, that connects to a very robust bus service uh, in and around the region, including to uh, metro stops that are nearby and Dulles Airport. And then finally, the regional trail, which is the Washington Old Dominion Trail, which uh, does lead into Alexandria, Virginia, and some of the first green suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, looking at a transportation framework from a larger perspective. This is um, Tyson's, Virginia, uh, previously Tyson's Corner. And Tyson's is a 2100 acre area, area that currently contains 90,000 jobs, uh, roughly 20,000 residents, and 36 million square feet of non-residential development. So I would say uh, 
Chris will go into this a little bit, but this is one of the biggest opportunities in the country to get a suburban retrofit right. It's not a small area, it's a very large area, so there's a, a lot of things that are gonna have to be done to really pull together the pieces. But the goal uh, for this area from Fairfax County, which Tyson's is in, uh, by 2050 is to have 200,000 jobs up from 90,000 and 100,000 residents up from about 20,000. To accommodate the, the growth of the, there's new zoning that was put in place that was adopted concurrent to the uh, 2010 plan, which also includes improvements in development review. So I would say I've worked in a number of communities and one of the improvements we consistently try to make, particularly literally to uh, really put out uh, the ability to, for developers to move through the process was improving the development review process and make it more developer friendly. However, while holding them to certain uh, improvements. This is the grid of streets on the left side. This is pre-plan. Uh, and on the right side, you can see a revised grid of streets that will be implemented. In 2013, the Fairfax County Board established a mechanism to fund what will be, what you're seeing here is a $3.1 billion plan to improve the roads and the transit near. So the, the county itself will fund neighborhood and access improvements such as sidewalks, trails, the bike and, bu uh, bike and bus circulator routes. And redevelopment in the area will pay for the grid and with contribution rates that are tied to non-residential space and residential units. So as development comes in, that will help to fund the $3.1 billion fund. So overall, it will be half uh, funded by redevelopment and half by new taxes in uh, Tyson's Transportation Service District. A very ambitious plan but it is a 30 to 40 year plan that as if development continues at the pace it is, will uh, will fulfill the obligation of that plan. And here's just a picture of, of Tyson's uh, intersection of the two main uh, streets there. This is 1936 to show how the suburb grew. Here's an image from 1993. Um, believe it or not, we did have colored images in 1993. <laughs> uh, here's 2013. You can see the Metro Silver Line coming through at an above grade alignment. Unfortunately, it wasn't below grade, but uh, this abrupt grade alignment does kind of give a futuristic uh, Jetsons type view through Tyson's as you ride the silver line uh, through this area. And this is an image from today where the cranes continue to go up uh, with a mixture of uses and filling up that grid uh, plan and also uh, contributing to the open spaces throughout the area. And moving on to open space, uh, this is uh, just a quick anecdote on this image. This is uh, from Reston Town Center, and you can see a pavilion at the, at the kind of the top there where a bunch of people are hanging out. This was the earliest portion uh, built of Reston Town Center, and early in the plan, there was a um, requirement for a cultural amenity or uh, some type of a museum where you see this pavilion today. But what happened is prior to that being developed, the community really uh, kind of congregated and, and gathered around this pavilion as, as the community central gathering place and, and open space. And uh, fast forward uh, decades and the pavilion idea has stuck because this is what kind of the people have um, seen as the most valuable piece to this development. So uh, the best planned ideas don't always come to fruition and it's through uh, the use of pedestrians that you start to really realize what is uh, most important in the community. So one of the characteristics under uh, open space I like to talk about is a multi-layered public realm. And by that, I mean something that would, a public realm that would give you a range of possibilities that are key to the activities that most residents want, but also reflects the taste and needs of smaller suburbs. Uh, for example, uh, you know, if there's a group who wants a dog park or a skateboard park, those groups should be listened to just so at minimum their concerns and aspirations are on the table, whether or not they fit into an ultimate program uh, as we see. But uh, it, just to say, that is to say, meaningful, meaningful input from community members, uh, both for design and programming, uh, is, is extremely important. So I would say that design is half of uh, designing a public realm and programming is another half of that. So it's vitally important. Uh, here's another image from Reston Town Center. Uh, this is just to show, illustrate a, a multifunctional public realm. So while you have a layered public realm such as this on the right side of the screen and the left side is where you may have a more passive open space, uh, you have the red in the middle where you have a main street and a uh, pedestrian pathways in a public plaza 
that can accommodate a range of activities. So multi-layered in that it, it offers different opportunities within a network of open spaces and so on. And multifunctional meaning that um, there are a, a range of things to do in this, uh, within one of the open spaces itself. So for example, this is Reston Town Square Park. At one and a quarter acres, uh, the square <coughs> includes roughly seven distinct areas in which uh, the way it was designed within which a variety of activities take place. Uh, so essentially there's a number of outdoor rooms that accommodate experiences for all ages and, and abilities. And on any given day, you will see this being used as a neighborhood park uh, for a wide variety uh, of, of uh, possibilities. And then finally, uh, buildings and, and land use, and I won't go so much into this, and uh, this covers the placement of buildings, uh, you know, typically to the street to make something uh, environment walkable, um, placement of uh, transit and open space and, and proximity to buildings is important, the intensity of buildings as well as the uh, use mix of the buildings. This is a land use plan that came out of the Tyson's uh, plan in 2010, and you can see the M at uh, four, the, four M's are the metro stops in the area. So four distinct neighborhoods were built up around the silver line that goes through Tyson's. And if you look at the land uses, you can see that transit station mixed use, the highest intensity and greatest mixture of uses are based uh, in closest proximity to the metro stops. And then the uses and intensities uh, fade as you go further away. Another element within buildings and land use is a diverse mix of choices. This is uh, Rockville Town Square in Rockville, Maryland, and uh, this is a federal realty development. And this is was a public-private partnership on the left side of the image is a innovation center and public library that was built in conjunction with this open space and uh, retail mixture with uh, residential and, and some parking garages. It's about a quarter mile or so from Metro stop there. And, uh, but what this environment does is it was built, uh, gives the residents who have now claimed this area as their central gathering place, um, gives them a diverse mix of choices in one walkable uh, environment. Uh, we'll also note, and this is something uh, we will talk about in future webinars, but uh, David and I really want to talk about affordability and equity um, as part of suburban uh, development, but that's not the main thrust of today. But I will say that this, in close proximity to this development in Rockville Town Square was recently announced a, a building that will, a residential building that will be reserved 25% for those with disabilities, which I think is great. <clears throat> All right, uh, and then one of the final characteristics is authenticity. And authenticity, one thing you don't hear often is the words authentic and suburb in the same sentence. Uh, in my mind, authenticity refers to strategies that communities use to capture local spirit. So in the case, what you're seeing here, this is, a, uh, this is uh, an area called Sherlington, which is also in Arlington, Virginia. And it's based on an older uh, strip center from the 40s, 50s that had finally built out uh, as a suburban retrofit over the last few decades. But what makes Sherlington authentic is the fact that there are dozens of local restaurants and stores that uh, residents can kind of claim as their own as well as a local theater and library in this development and what things like this begin to do especially if you have a local restaurant tours and, and retailers is create a very authentic experience so what happens in Shirlington is that it becomes very authentically Shirlington due to what the people bring to it and what the retailers and restaurant tours bring to it and I'm just going to do a quick um, case study on Overland Park where I also used to work and, and talk about how they've dealt with um, their suburban redevelopment. Uh, Overland Park being a very quintessential um, suburb that grew up, as you can see on the left side, from 1900 to 2007, you can see the outward suburban expansion really based on this one mile uh, grid of very efficient thoroughfares. Um, what happens in between is a different story. but. In 2007, uh, the community adopted a Vision Metcalf plan, and uh, what that did was uh, led to the development of a local policy framework that was supportive uh, or, or uh, supportive of adopting a regulation uh, that would start to implement the plan. And I'll say that Overland Park really um, 
ran into the, the plan was adopted in 2007, which is right at the beginning of the recession. Uh, I think that one thing that illustrates, and I think many communities have run into this, that planning during downtime when development's not occurring is really a great time to plan so that when you do come out of a recession, for example, that uh, your resources and regulations are in place for you. Uh, but one thing this did do, since development was not occurring hardly at all in, in the over parts of downtown, it allowed for, as the recession faded and development started to come back, it allowed for incremental growth in, in the suburb. It wasn't a massive new town center was plopped down in the downtown, but rather it's it's incremental and it's one building at a time that has kind of started to build this plan. Um, so Overland Park developed a form-based code in its downtown, and what the code did is took set 19 zoning districts, and uh, including six where they were uh, specifically designated for downtown, and converted it to about six different uh, building form standards. You can see the zoning district on the left and the, the form-based code regulating plan on the right, which is uh, really developed to uh, create predictable development for the developers as they came to the table to contribute to the downtown development. One of the issues that was we were facing uh, as planners and community was the unwillingness of community members who typically, uh, they, were, they were used to strip developments uh, sprawling out far to the south, but it was uh, difficult for them to uh, oftentimes grasp that they were, we were recommending doing things a little bit different. So what we had to do was show them that of a 75 uh, square mile town, we're actually looking at to to uh, test this on a half mile basis in the downtown, half square mile basis. So we had to show people that there was there are baby steps that can be taken before rolling this out uh, more walkable uh, mixed use development to the rest of the community. So what uh, downtown ended up looking like in the plan was based around you can see at the center of the green shed, uh, which is an existing farmers market. But the plan uh, really looked at using that as the authentic center of the community based around that. Well, downtown Overland Park today has, uh, based around the farmer's market, culinary center, uh, oil shop, uh, spice shop, things that really have grown up to be authentically Overland Park. Uh, as the downtown continues to grow, uh, actually there's been, you know, since the form-based code came out, there's been over $126 million in development, over, uh, hundreds of residential units, thousands of square feet of retail and office and millions more square feet proposed so the plan is starting to take root and I, I believe as the plan grows it will only reinforce what was set up as creating an authentic Overland Park experience in the downtown. Uh, so finally I'm just going to leave a couple uh, words, uh, emphasis that I would like to people to remember when you're looking at streets and circulation you want to make sure they're walkable and connected, looking at open space and public realm, they're accessible and multi-layered. And then when you're looking at buildings and land use, that they are engaging and diverse. And uh, with that, I am finished with my portion. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jason. I'm gonna to try to hand it over to Chris. Great, and can my slides be seen? You just got control. Let's see if we can see them. All right, I see. Looks good. You can see them? Okay. So we're here talking about the urbanization of the suburbs, and it is the major trend of the next generation. And um, the thing that you should know about my perspective is that it comes from the private sector. For 20 years, I ran and owned the largest real estate consulting firm in the country. Then I became a developer building walkable urban places. And this is now my think tank academic phase of life, trying to understand it. And by the way, you noticed that a lot of these examples that um, have been used have come from Metro DC, and you'll see some more from Metro DC, in fact, some of the same. And that is because Metro DC, my research has always shown, is the model by which we're building this country, which is not to say that, as David said, there's a lot of great urbanization uh, a lot of great urbanizing suburbs taking place in Atlanta, in Dallas, in Los Angeles, but um, Metro DC got there first. And that's the reason I moved here uh, 13 years ago was because this is, seems to be where it's happening, um, at least first. The other thing to note <clears throat> is, and, and 
and this would change a little bit some of David's observations, that his observations are actually understating what's, you know, how powerful this trend is. Because he was using data that we've all been forced to use over the last half century of dividing all of our research into urban versus suburban. And that concept should be thrown out. There's no, there's no use for it anymore. What you should be thinking about is walkable urban places and drivable sub-urban places. That hyphen is intentional. And basically, walkable urban places can take place in both the city and in the suburbs. But the thing is, is that walkable urban places are fundamentally different. That <clears throat> for those of us that, that have been around this business a long time, drivable suburban it, it is, of course, how we cut our teeth, which is separate land uses, uh, very, very low density, sprawled out all over creation. And the only way to get around is by cars and truck. And, and it likens, in my mind, that we got very good at driving mass cars which go about 150 miles an hour, and they can only turn left or go straight. What we have to learn how to do is learn how to fly fighter jets, which go 600 miles an hour and turn left or right, go up or down, get, go up five miles or crash and burn in seconds while you're being shot at. It's a much more complex set of skills. But if you do follow that more complex path, which is what the market's demanding, you start an upward spiral of value creation that within walking distance, and that's key, you've heard this many, many times, that within walking distance, which is about 1,500 to 3,000 feet, as you add more assets, as somebody adds more assets, the value of the place, the quality of life, the vibrancy, the property taxes, just start this upward spiral of value creation. And now, there's no such thing as a free lunch. The issue that needs to be consciously addressed is, of course, affordable housing and a workforce housing policy, a conscious at the walkable urban place level. So when you look at the country the way that we do at, at George Washington and also at Brookings, where I, where, where I also hang my hat, as I mentioned, two ways of building the built environment, walkable urban, drivable suburban on the left. There's two regionally, uh, there's, there's two economic uses of land use. Local serving on the right is um, bedroom communities. 90% of the square footage is residential. 10% is support commercial. And then the other use of land from an economic point of view is regionally significant. This is where the wealth is created. This is where jobs locate. So it creates a four cell matrix. And what we do when we look at a metropolitan area is drop the walkable urban into the upper two um, quadrants and the drivable suburban into the two bottom. And you see these percentages that the walkable urban regionally significant places, what, what, what we call for short walk-ups, is about 1%, in fact, maybe less, of the total land use. And the local serving walkable urban places are between 2 and 6%. Long story short, it's really about, on average, it's 3 4% on, in total, sometimes as high as 5 Rarely is it over 5 And the other 95% of the land use is drivable suburban. And, oh, by the way, it's illegal to build walkable urban in that other 95% because of zoning, NIMBY opposition, thus driving up the price of walkable urban land. That's the the number one reason we have gentrification is because we don't have enough walkable urban land. Here is Arlington, Virginia. Arlington, Virginia is the town that you've got to know if you want to understand the urbanization of the suburbs. And they've done it, uh, that they started sooner, earlier, and faster, and with more enlightenment. Not that they're perfect, um, but they've got 11% of their landmass is walkable urban, regionally significant walk-ups uh, that is generating tremendous benefits for them. And then they have another 20% of their land that's local serving walkable urban places. So they've got a third of their, uh, of their total acreage is walkable urban, highly unusual, 
very high numbers. Here's how Metro DC lays out. So you can see the square, the diamond, I should say, in the middle. That's the old District of Columbia, the original District of Columbia. Currently, it's only, after, 14, um, after 1847, it's only east, northeast of the Potomac River. And the southwest is Arlington County and Alexandria. They were given back to, to Virginia in 1847. So, and then the Beltway is around it. So there's different types of walkable urban places. We have those that start in the downtown, uh, that start in the center city, such as downtown DC. Then there's downtown adjacent places. There's urban commercial places, but then you move out to the suburbs. And here are suburban town centers, 18th, 19th century towns that were farm to market towns, got absorbed by the sprawl in, in the late 20th century went downhill economically in the late 20th century and are now roaring back. Here's the biggie. These are drivable suburban places like regional malls and business parks that are now, many of them, not all of them, being converted into walkable urban places. That blob number 37 to the west is Tyson's, the largest suburban agglomeration in the country 48 million square feet of unmitigated traffic hell, which as you saw from Jason's slides, and I'll show you some more, is fundamentally pulling off a U-turn in how they're growing. Then we have greenfields. These are, and greenfield and also brownfields. These are completely virgin or, or uh, reclaimed land and it's just add water and poof, you have instant urbanity. These are really difficult to pull off, very expensive, a lot of upfront money. By the way, 22 up there to the north is the Kentlands, very famous new urbanist project. This is the favorite quarter, the red arc coming out of downtown. This is what's dominated metropolitan development trends for the last 60 years. What you know about or where the favorite quarter is, it's, it's where the rich white folk live. Race has always di uh, uh, dictated metropolitan development trends. Here's the non-favorite quarter to the east. The great thing about walkable urbanism that we're beginning to understand here in Metro DC is that we're seeing the expansion of the favorite quarter into the non-favorite quarter because of the appeal of lower, uh, lower cost walkable urbanism in the non-favorite quarter. From a social equity point of view, this is the biggest trend of the early 21st century. Here's the Metro line. And the Metro line um, is uh, of the 64 walkable urban places that are now in Metro DC, well, again, what we call walk-ups, these are the regionally significant places, 80% of them are rail transit service, but 20% are not. So it's not impossible to do walk-ups without, um, without transit. So the, an interesting thing about DC as well is how it splits between the district, the center city, and the suburbs as far as where the walkable urban is happening. And 49% of the total square footage of walkable urban development in this cycle has gone to the District of Columbia. And 51% of the total square footage has gone to the suburbs. We think this is a indicator of where the rest of the country is going, that it's at least 50-50 between city and suburb. And I think in the case such as Dallas, Fort Worth, it's probably 60-40. So here are the different types of walkable urban areas in the suburbs. We have major town centers that I showed you in Washington. What we've seen down in Dallas, Fort Worth is small town centers that are actually becoming regionally significant. They don't have to have the density that we've seen in these major town centers. Then in the lower left-hand corner, the redeveloped drivable suburban places, again, business parks, regional malls being converted into high-density, walkable urban places, and then finally, greenfield and brownfield development. The thing about the, the product mix of these places is that they're fundamentally different when you look at downtown 
product mixes, where it's, as you can see, 83% here in Metro DC of the downtown walk-ups are office space and only 1% retail. And the fastest growing, but it's only 6% right now of the total square footage is residential. When you go out to the suburbs, you'll find that less office, far more retail, because many times they have regional malls that have been converted into walkable urban malls and a much higher percentage of residential. So we see a fundamentally different product mix fingerprint of center city walk-ups versus suburban walk-ups. So back to Arlington. This is really important because this is one of the great lessons they've learned. This is Arlington in this picture of the Sears that closed in the 1980s along Wilson Boulevard, which is their main drag going to the west, a major commuter boulevard over the last 60, 70 years. And the Sears store closed. And to the left is the big box. It's empty. To the right is the former garden center. And where the picture was taken is the, is the tire and car repair center, all closed in the 1980s. This is the same shot, same perspective today. What you're looking at is um, the, the garden center is now a Whole Foods. There's an Apple store in there. There's a lot of restaurants. There's housing immediately behind it and higher than the retail, of course. And that housing's selling for six to $700 per square foot. Two blocks north and south of this picture, it feathers back to single family housing, what we call the aurora in the suburbs of the impact of these great walkable urban places on the surrounding drivable suburban suburbs. What has happened in the auroras is that they have achieved the highest priced housing in Arlington on a sales per square foot basis, on a dollar per square foot basis. And the reason for that they have the best of two worlds. They can live in suburbia and walk to 50 restaurants, walk to the metro center, maybe walk to work. And, there, and as a result, we're seeing in Arlington a 100% price premium for, for those suburban houses that are in the Aurora because of that best of both worlds, as, as compared to a similar house a half mile away that's not, uh, that's not uh, considered walkable. But the other thing that's happened is that this 11% of the land that I mentioned earlier in Arlington that's comprised of regionally significant walkable urban places, 25 years ago when it looked like the picture in the upper left-hand corner, it, represent, it represented 20% of the tax base of Arlington and falling. Today, it's 55% of the tax base. They basically shifted the tax burden in Arlington County onto mixed-use walkable urban places. And one of the big complaints, of course, is always, what about the schools? Well, it turns out that all that housing that, that you see there, because about half of the all new development over the last 25 years has been housing, much of it rental apartment. Great concern, oh my God, we're gonna actually have to educate poor people. That's so un-American. So uh, instead what happened is that all these folks moved into the rental apartments and these condos, and then they forgot to have kids. That they are paying school taxes, but they have a one-eighth generation ratio of school-age kids per household than those single-family houses two blocks away. So as a result, Arlington has among the best schools in the country. So let me show you some of the other examples throughout this region and throughout the country. Here's Bethesda. It's a suburban town center just north of the District of Columbia. And it's really exploded. This is where Marriott is building their new high-rise world headquarters. And they're moving out of a business park about five miles away. Here's another suburban center, Silver Spring. This is the most diverse walkable urban place possibly in the country as far as racial and income integration. This is where a Discovery Channel 
um, has its headquarters, its worldwide headquarters, though they are moving to New York. Um, and by the way, the reason that a discovery is here is because the, the founder went to Silver Spring High School, so wanted to found his company in his hometown. But great transit accessibility, fabulous urban vitality. But it doesn't, it's not obviously just D.C. Here is Bellevue, Washington, um, right across Lake Washington from downtown Seattle. Incredibly intense, walkable urban place. Coming back now, looking to drivable suburban redevelopment. This is one of the most important ones in the country. This is the Mosaic District. This, this, by the way, may look like renderings. These are real photographs. And this is a place that six years ago was a big box retailer surrounded by a huge surface parking lot. And they put in the grid that Jason just talked about, high density, mixed use, walkable urban, it's exploded. And this is where the classic Ozzie and Harriet family now congregates with their kids. Here's one of the most important drivable suburban redos in the country. This is White Flint, north of Washington, D.C. It's next to the White Flint metro station. This is what it looked like six years ago, a 20-acre, god ugly strip mall. They tore it down. This is Federal Realty. They tore it down. This is phase one. This is the entrance into phase one. And this is now, this is just a rendering, of course, but this is actually what it looks like. I need to get a, a better picture of this because this is all up except for the two buildings numbered 13 in this image. The entire grid of streets is in retail on the ground floor, housing, office, hotels up above. It's been a remarkable success. It's, it's called Pike and Rose. And by the way, this is where Marriott used to be. Marriott used to be in the lower right-hand corner photo. And, well, they actually still are as they're waiting for their high-rise office building to be built in downtown Bethesda. The upper left-hand corner is another business park building. Both of these have been vacated by their anchor tenants. Or, or in the case of Marriott, will be. So that's known that in two years, Marriott's leaving. Both of these buildings recently traded hands. They sold for 10 to 20% of their value that they, were, that they had in 2005. They sold for 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. This is, in, this is an indication of an article I wrote in The Atlantic 10 years ago entitled The Next Slum. And it's one of the, the biggest social challenges we're going to have in this country over the next 20, 30 years. Here's a Denver regional mall that was the first regional mall in suburban Denver. Obviously highly, highly successful when, they, um, when this picture was taken in 1970. By 2000, it was dark. And they bulldozed it, put in a grid of streets. And today, Belmar, the newly uh, christened Belmar, is getting 60% price premiums over every other uh, competitive development in its submarket in southwest Denver. That's for office, rental apartment, retail, or housing. So Tyson's, coming back to Tyson's, just as Jason talked about it, this is the cover story I wrote um, for Development Magazine this summer about the fundamental transformation of Tyson's. Um, and you just saw these images from Jason, Tyson's in 1938, Tyson's in 1988. This, of course, is the original Edge City when Joe Garreau wrote the book in the late 80s. This is the districts of Ty the, uh, the sub-districts of Tyson's, eight of them. But the thing is, is that it's emerging as not one monolithic place. We think there's going to be five different walk-ups in Tyson's, and it's only going to occupy 1,100 of the 2,400 acres that is Tyson's. And so um, what's happening is that the drivable suburban stuff outside of these circles 
will be holding ter- will be holding tanks for people that want to get into the walkable urban but can't afford it. And here's one example of the new Tysons. This is the largest project in the post metro rail era of Tysons. This is under construction right now. This delivers next year. This is one and a half million square feet, Whole Foods on the ground floor. It's the largest Whole Foods in the world. Um, High-end movie theater, condos, rental apartments, offices. All of these product types are achieving the highest rents or sales prices in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. They are achieving downtown D.C. and Georgetown rents and, and for sale prices. There's such pent-up demand for great walkable urbanism. So Dallas really is roaring back as a walkable urban place. This is D Magazine, uh, the June issue of D Magazine, which was 100% uh, devoted to walkable urbanism and new urbanism in Dallas. The owner of the magazine is a friend of mine, Over Scotch. We dreamt this up earlier this year, and he did it, 200 pages of great, walkable urbanism in Dallas. So you can see places such as Waters Creek, which is a which is a, a greenfield development to the north, and uptown Dallas, a downtown adjacent place, and Grapevine, which is a suburban town center that is obviously has a great historic character coming back very handsomely. So walkable urban is in Dallas as well. Here's an example in the north suburbs of, of Metro Atlanta. Um, it's called Avalon, Greenfield Development. Uh, phase two of this project, which I don't have photos of yet, have, has recently delivered, highly successful. Here's a project that my development company has done outside of Philadelphia, about a mile from the King of Prussia Mall, which is the largest regional mall on the East Coast, and here is a conversion of a golf course into a town center. By the way, when I mentioned that you know, 90, you know, 90, 95% of all land in metropolitan areas, it's illegal to build walkable urbanism. This project took 12 years to gain the entitlements. And the only way, way we got it was to win at the state Supreme Court. We were the only ones that were foolish enough to go through the brain damage to uh, deliver this product, but nobody else got through the process. Therefore, we have the market to ourselves. It's incredible price premiums, but this just points out why we have an affordable housing problem in this country. We don't have enough walkable urban land. And then the granddaddy. I always have to end with a granddaddy, rest in town center. I worked on this as a consultant back in the late 80s. Ironically, Mobile Oil was the developer of this walkable urban place. But this is the one that started it all as far as Greenfield walkable urbanism. It, it, uh, next year, it gets Metro Rail service. And then, of course, Crystal City. Now in the headlines, uh, Crystal City is, is now the, you know, this, the second or third headquarters of of Amazon, and it is a it's it's going to see a fundamental transformation. So let me end by talking about one thing that's been missing in the suburbs that we've learned in our center cities how to do, and that's what we call the the fourth level of governance that is missing in our society. We have, of course, federal, state, and local government. We have two levels of governance that's missing. One is at the regional level. We all know that. The Council of Governments and, and um, transit agencies are all pretty weak and don't have enough resources. But the other one is place management under government, un- under local government. These are business improvement districts, main streets. These are crucial to create great walkable urbanism. And it takes a, I liken it to a three-legged stool that the public sector has to set the table. The private sector invests $10, $15 for every $1 of public money. But the key is place management. And most place management is paid for by the private sector. 
And again, it takes the form of business improvement districts, community improvement districts. They have a lot of different names, main streets, but it is key to make these places work and it needs to be working 24 seven. One of the best examples of place management is Clyde Warren Park in downtown Dallas that links downtown and uptown Dallas with a five acre park on top of a 12 lane freeway. And it has been a remarkable economic and social success since it opened three years ago. So the urbanization of the suburbs is the major development trend of the 21st century. And we have a lot of work to do. And it's a very exciting time to be in real estate and urbanism. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I've got a few questions coming in and I'll hand this over to Lisa for just a few minutes to do some um, Q&A. So, Lisa, are you uh, with us? Thank, great. Thank you, Jen. Yes. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to start off with a question. I've, I've received a few that I'll, I'll be queuing up. Um, Jason, you mentioned briefly that in your work on Suburban Remix with David that the two of you really now want to go further in depth on suburban poverty and a report from Brookings, uh, several reports from, from previous years have found that poverty is growing faster now in the suburbs than anywhere else in, in the, um, of, of any other type of place. Um, so I wonder if you could talk, either of you, either David or you, talk just a little bit. And Chris, please feel free as well, because you touched on this in your talk, just to, to address um, more specifically what we're going to need to do to, um, to be ready uh, for folks who do not have a lot of disposable income in the suburbs. Uh, Jason, do you want to start or do you want me to jump in? Oh, David, I was thinking maybe you would address Dayton or some of your other um, projects. Sure. Um, so I'm going to well, let me speak more broadly. First of all, you have we have to, to to accept the fact or sort of start with the fact that when folks are displaced from an urban area that has a, a um, uh, for better or worse, a much better network of social service um, pro, uh, government agencies and and, and uh, nonprofits in a place to uh, and often transit maybe bus, but you but ways to get around if you can't afford a car. And most folks under the poverty line in this country find it very difficult to afford a car. When you're displaced out to a suburb, you lose access. Uh, you also lose uh, proximity to those social service agencies and other services that, that have been very helpful. Uh, you also, your kids lose access to schools that frankly are accustomed to educating a broader, broader cross-section of folks from an economic standpoint, I'm being, being polite here. Uh, so one of the things that's really important, and Chris talked a lot about the, the fiscal benefits of walk-ups. In our experience at good old Santex Urban Places, when we plan a, a new um, a suburban downtown, uh, redevelop a, a, a failing mall or a, or a, a, stri a strip center, um, the value, the fiscal value goes up generally sometimes between by eight or 16 times which is critical uh, if you look at what's happening to the basically declining real estate tax base, which is the main tax base and, and retail tax base, the other main tax base in most suburbs, is critical to fund the services that folks need. But beyond this, we also have to make sure if we create a, a walkable, amenity-rich, uh, animated place, the kinds of, of, of places that Chris just literally ran through and, and actually across the country, he, le he left Washington, the kinds of places I saw in Dallas earlier this year. Um, these places are far more valuable we have to tap some of this value to pay for economic diversity, affordable housing. If you can't, you can't expand housing supply to create affordability. You have to invest in housing that people of low incomes can't afford. And once again, our, for a whole bunch of reasons that go beyond this webinar, we live in a society that no longer can lift people out of poverty by growing our economy. Those benefits uh, go to at best the top 40% uh, to a large extent to the top 10 and even 5% of us. Um, uh, Jason and Chris, do you want to jump in? Two things. One is, is um, that I would suggest that 
that place management organizations, and I'm working with a number of them, take responsibility for the social equity of their places so that they are the ones that engage in what David just referred to as what, 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 is, what is known as private sector value capture, whereby those huge increases in property taxes on the public side and valuations on the private side, that a portion of that upside is captured and recycled into affordable housing. And I think the best organization to do it are the business improvement districts and other place management organizations. The other big issue to address the next slum problem, again, I wrote about this first 10 years ago, so, um, and it's gonna be a very intransigent problem because it is, as David mentioned, low density spread out social dysfunction. It's gonna be very hard to service it. Um, but the best way is to build walkable urbanism in the non-favored quarter. So in Prince George's County, in Prince William County, here in Metro DC, uh, on the south side of Dallas, on the south side of Atlanta, where high density mixed use walkable urban places, and you can bring opportunity to those neighborhoods. Now, a lot, you know, one of the big problems that people are going to have with that is, oh my God, you're bringing opportunity to me. That means I'm going to be driven out. And so you have to make sure it, A, it doesn't happen, it's managed, but B, educate to, uh, to, to help people understand that bringing opportunities for more jobs close to where you live is a good thing. So those are the two major solutions that I think are possible, but even those two are not going to address what my research shows is could be even 50% of metropolitan land use that is threatened by the concept of the next slum. Let me, this is a really yeah. important question. So I'm sorry, did I interrupt you, Chris? I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to add in quickly. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just want to pick up on, on something Chris said, I think is very important. And this, we're spending a lot of time answering probably the most, one of the most important questions here, which is that uh, there's a, a, um, Professor at uh, of uh, labor and economics professor at MIT, Michael Piori, whose focus is is labor, uh, and one of the points he keeps making uh, is given in a in a um, uh, society in an economy where ninety some odd percent of net new jobs require college educations, uh, and where the folks we're talking about who are being forced out to suburbs by and large do not have college educations, we can move jobs to walkable centers, but unless we connect people in the suburbs who are living under poverty to these jobs with really aggressive training programs, in fact, a lot of these jobs don't really require a college degree. We just don't have any other way of qualifying people because we don't have the right kind of technical and other training uh, that can really help lift people out of the poverty that they're in into our economy. This is an, got to be an, uh, an area that I know Jason and I both want to focus on more as we continue to look at uh, what's happening to suburbs. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, quickly, from a regulate, regulatory perspective, there are a lot of uh, progressive communities that are requiring an a affordable dwelling unit uh, provision for residential projects. Um, they're not perfect. There are ways for developers to get out of providing uh, affordable dwelling units in a uh, project, but in the DC area, there are a number of communities that are requiring you know, anywhere from 10, 15% of units in a residential development uh, be affordable to uh, to a certain percentage of the, the area median income. And okay. next question, we have a... Um, yeah, I mean, I do want to check in with Jen just briefly because we do have a lot of participants still with us, but it, we have hit our 130 mark. Jen, should I just go ahead and come up with another yeah. couple questions. We've got some here. Yeah, okay. I think so. We we still have a lot of people on, great, so great, let's great. do another six minutes or so. Great. Okay, and I'll ask the gentleman for a preference of scale. I've got some questions here that are very fine-grained questions about design, and then I've got one other um, big picture question. So what's your preference? Why don't we start big picture and then go to design? Okay, this is the biggest picture of all. Um, 
why suburban development as opposed to concentration on downtowns? And there's a follow-up question about density, but I'll just, let me, let let's me, just start with that one. Let me jump into that. And that's because there's a market for it, that there's a lot of folks who only have lived in, in downtown or in the suburbs and that the, uh, that all the social networks are there. They might still be working and they, and they, and they have their job there. Um, and they are scared of coming into a downtown. So I'd much prefer them to be work, uh, living in a mixed use walkable urban place because it's the number one thing we can do to address climate change in this country. So, um, there's just a huge market for folks that do not want to come into a downtown. Um, unlike myself, I love living in downtown DC, but there's a, you know, 50, 60% of us would rather live in an urbanized suburb. And so there's a big market for it. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say not all demand uh, will be able to be satisfied in downtowns as well. Yeah. Uh, what suburbs offer us is uh, you know, great land banks of land, such as uh, you know, dead or dying malls or strip strip centers uh, that are maybe uh, fading. For so these uh, offer land banks, these gray fields for future development to satisfy uh, that demand. In a world where, in a country where literally 90% of households, let's say by the late 2020s, will be uh, either have no kids or only have one adult in kids, there are other implications, and on balance would prefer urban living. As Jason said, there's just no room in our urban cores. But but beyond that, uh, as Jason said, the suburbs hold the failed shopping mall, uh, uh, malls, uh, strip centers, office parks. And when we're out working with suburbs, these are these are a, a tremendous resource. These are now redevelopable. These are the these these are the place where we can actually accommodate the the large bulk of this demand. When Chris says the urbanization of suburbia is the the issue of our era going forward, or I forgot how you phrased it exactly, part of that is it's because it's the only place that we can accommodate our much more urban population and and society and values. Okay, um, great, that's, thank you. Um, someone asked a very specific question, uh, three experts here. What is the density of urban versus suburban? Is there a rule of thumb? This is above. Chris, my, my, yeah. my rule of thumb is, is above 1.0 FAR. It might go down to 0.8 FAR, floor area ratio, um, but from one, it can go all the way up. I, this morning, I was up in Midtown Manhattan. That's the most dense place, of course, in the country. That's probably a 40 FAR. Most of the, the urbanizing suburbs are going to be anywhere from one to probably four, at most five FARs. So, you know, anybody that says that there's going to be a Manhattanization of Arlington or <laughs> Topeka or, you know, fill in the blank as far as any town or suburb uh it's not going to happen it's the manhattanization is not happening it's a much lower density again probably between one and five far and so this is david to, to jump in and and uh from another perspective get to uh, chris's one as a th far as a threshold the the measure we use is how much density primarily of housing housing supports does it take to bring a block of walkable Main Street to life, which is what most people, when people basically live in a community where you can walk to shop, to eat, to have fun, et cetera, they begin to think of it as, as urban. Uh, and it turns out that if you can get about one to 2,000 housing units, and that might be very roughly enough, they are one to two, within a five minute walk, depending on incomes, you've got enough disposable income to attract the kind of core, the compact critical mass of retail that would bring a block of Main Street to life. Uh, and 
uh, and this is that it doesn't provide all the uh, doesn't support all the sales this retail needs. And again, much of this retail these days, when I say retail, I think restaurants, food experience. Uh, but it's enough to attract the retailers who then create a destination that works. And what we are talking to uh, cities and uh, to, to sub suburban communities from a planning standpoint or with our own developer clients, what we basically say is if you can't get at least a thousand units within a five minute walk, that's a quarter mile, that's an FAR of roughly one, you really don't have much of a chance of bringing a street to life. Maybe you can. If you can get to 2000, you've got an excellent chance. Okay, and I think, unfortunately, this probably will have to be our last question. We've gotten some some great, great questions. Um, but this one specifically for suburbs seems an interesting one. How do hotels impact authentic placemaking and general development of a walkable place? Our suburban city has a large amount of hotels located primarily in the areas where we are focusing mixed-use walkable development. Hotels can be a great uh, land use. Um, it, it, it adds lots of vitality uh, at nights and on weekends um, if they have a, uh, you know, the right the right marketing for those hotels. Um, the thing is, is that hotels only represent 1% of the total um, uh, square footage of metropolitan real estate. 69%, going back to David's point, 69% of total square footage in most metropolitan areas is housing. And about 5% is office, 6% is retail, but only 1% is hotels. So recognize that it's a very rare commodity. But there's a great example of, of a suburban, of an urbanizing suburb here in DC called National Harbor. And one of their major economic legs to their stool is convention oriented hotels. And now they need to add to it and they are, but it was the first economic driver of that place. And it's an intriguing greenfield development to watch as it grows. It's not my cup of tea personally, but I'm in, but I'm a city kind of guy. Okay, not not my. This is David. Not my cup of tea either. I was debating whether to say it, but you you opened the door. Uh, this is probably not the direction of the question, but I think it's really worth noting that of all the the real estate uses we can bring into a suburban center, hotels probably provide the most upward mobility for local residents who don't have college educations and are having trouble getting into our changing economy. They uh, actually represent great paths uh, in and up uh, for folks who are struggling. Uh, and uh, I, I realize that doesn't drive location decisions, et cetera, but, but if you as a community are thinking about the role hotels play, one thing to remember is they, in an odd way, represent a kind of a democratization of your uh, local real estate economy. Okay, um, I think I'm going to hand it back to Jen. There's so much more here uh, that we could go into, but um, can, can I ask a question? Uh, can you email? Back. Can you send us the questions? And, and yes, Chris and Jason, absolutely. I can email. People have been so kind to hang on. We can email responses. You bet. Wow, that's a that's a great um, great offer. And we'll do that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you all attending for dealing with our internet outage here in DuPont. Um, you can be in the center of the world and still lose the internet. So uh, sorry about that, but thank you all for uh, presenting. Uh, this was wonderful. We'll definitely get the questions that you've shared over to the presenters and try to get them answered as soon as possible. And um, we'll get the recording up as soon as we can as well. So please look out for uh, number two and number three of this series coming up in January and March. And thank you all again for attending today. Have a great week.